This is former World Wrestling Federation superstar Duke the Dumpster Drossy, and you are listening to Stu's Wrestling Podcast, and you better keep doing so because it's time to take out the trash. You're listening to Stu's Wrestling Podcast. It's time. Your host, Stu Palmer. My guest for episode 103 of Stu's Wrestling Podcast is none other than former WWE WWF talent Oscar, who was one third of Men on a Mission. It was an absolute honour and a privilege to get Oscar on. His tenure in WWE lasted from 93 to 95, so we get to hear about the new generation of guys that came through and the new generation era in WWE. He talks about the kindness of Owen and Bret Hart, and he talks about travelling the world while he was at WWE. So, without further ado, my guest is former WWF WWE talent and one third of Man on a Mission, Oscar. Enjoy. My guest today on Stu's Wrestling Podcast for episode 102, all the way from Atlanta, Georgia, in the good old US of A. It is rap artist and former talent in WWF, Oscar, who was part of Men on a Mission for up to two years. It was two years that you were in the WWF for. I was I just had to recap about that because I remember seeing you guys on screen. How are you today, Oscar? Am I right? Yeah, thank you for that intro. Yeah, um, I'm doing well. Um, I just got my uh, booster shot for COVID yesterday, so <laughs> I'm feeling confident now. <laughs> yeah, I had mine. I had mine about a month ago here in the UK. So yeah, it's uh, glad glad you've had your booster, man. We've got to keep. Got to keep uh, vaccinated of me. Absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, I'd like to talk to you about the WWF run. And I was looking into the background of you getting signed with WWF and how it came to be. And I saw that Randy Macho Man Savage was involved. You were like, highly yeah. recommend. You were highly recommended, weren't you? Well, it's a funny story. Um, there's a comedian named Andrew Dice Clay. Yeah. And I was in Las Vegas with him because I was, I had started doing shows with him. I was closing the shows down. He would do his routine, his show for about an hour and a half. Then I would get on stage and rap and close it. It was such an honor because it was while he was at his highest, his peak, where uh, he had, um, I think it was the Dice Cometh album was out and he was hot. And I was such a fan, and I rapped for him. And anyway, now we went to uh, Vegas. And as I was in Vegas, I happened to be at Caesar's Palace, and I was playing dice, craps. And there was this big commotion in the, lo- in the lobby. And for there to be a commotion at a casino where everybody's gambling, something really, really, really hot has got to be happening. And I looked up, and I saw this colorful character walking through the casino. And, of course, it was Macho Man Randy Savage. And I said, you know, I need to go over there and do, like, a singing telegram because, I mean, he's one of my idols. I mean, one of my favorite guys. So I went up to him and I said, Macho Man, Macho Man, can I do a singing telegram for you real, real fast? And Vince was standing behind me, and he was like, yeah, go ahead. And so I did the rap for the Macho Man. I added Vince in the rap. Jerry Lawler was standing there, I added him. Mr. Perk was standing there, I added him. And Vince was like blown away. Macho Man was blown away. He was like, brother, you got a card? And Vince was like, no, no, no. I want you to call me at my office at the WWF in Stanford, Connecticut. Call me on Monday. So Monday came around, I called the office. His secretaries were real excited because Vince was like really waiting for my call. And I'm like, Vince was waiting for my call? But he was in he was flying, he was in the air. So they contacted him. He called me right back, right back. We stayed on the phone for about an hour. And two months after that phone call, oh wait, no, he sent me some tickets to go to WrestleMania 9. I'll never forget that. 
And uh, a month late after WrestleMania 9, I got a call from the WWF office. Uh, they flew me out to um, Connecticut, and they put me up at a hotel, a really nice hotel. The next day, the car comes to pick me up, and it's these two guys in the car. It was, it was uh, Nelson and Bobby. And I always remember that because when Nelson got out the car, I almost swallowed my tongue because I never saw an individual in real life that tall, that big. He was humongous. So we all go up into the WWF. We go into a conference room and Vince talks to us and says that he wants to make us men on a mission, Mo, Oscar, and Mabel. And that's how Men on a Mission was born. Incredible. Incre what perfect timing. You know when they say things happen for a reason as well. That's yeah, incredible. Exactly. That all them all them guys were around in, in Vegas, just the fact that they got... And, and Vince, Vince being there, man, that's just incredible. Incredible. Yeah, it, it was... Vince McMahon has such a presence. I mean, I, I just couldn't get over that I was standing that close to him, talking to him, and now I'm on my way to being a WWF superstar. It was, it was an amazing experience. I, I would not do nothing different that day if I had to go back. Was there like an intim intimidation factor with Vince? Because you hear from past, present, future talents within oh, the business. Oh, it was always. Yeah. It was always an intimidation factor, but at the same time for me. He was the nicest guy that, you know, people have stories about him, positive and negative, mm -hmm. but I don't have a negative thing to say. I mean, Vince was, I mean, I don't know, you know, I, I, I want to say this since you brought it up. There are a lot of guys in the business that work for Vince and they bash Vince and they, and, and they do, but um for those people, I feel like they're missing something. You know, you might have had some bad experiences. I mean, all my experiences in the business wasn't good. I mean, I got ribbed like nobody's business. But the point that I'm making is, you know, they talk about, talk negative about them at conventions or signings or things like that. But they forget one key thing. If it wasn't for Vince, 20 years later, you wouldn't be here today making no money. You know, you would not have had the experiences that you had. Vince McMahon single-handedly set us all on a path to where we're going to be able to do things for the rest of our lives. Once you're a WWE talent, then, you know, wrestling is in your blood and opportunities are afforded you. You know, maybe every now and then, but opportunities are still afforded you years down the line after your run. I mean, here I am, it, you know, participating in an interview with a guy from London in, interested in my career. I mean, you know, how many, how, 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 unless you have a hit show on television, and I mean, you know, I mean, how does the, you know, where does that happen? And I am definitely grateful for Vince. For every dime I've ever made in this business, past, present, and future. That's nice, man. That's nice to hear. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, good. Uh, very, very nice to hear. Absolutely. Now, I'd like to ask you. I'd like to go into the road schedule. You know, being on the road. So, I'd like to ask you guys about it. You know, it's very, very intense. We hear about. But how was your experiences on the road with WWF, WWE at that time? You know, with with Bobby and Nelson with Mabel and Mo? You know, being on the road, you're on the road probably, I don't know, 280, 300 days uh, uh, out of the year. I mean, they were having events like every single day and you were a participant. You really got no rest. I remember getting four days off and when I got home, I, the phone rang and they took those days back because somebody canceled. So they was putting me and Bobby Nelson back out on the road. But uh, to further answer your question, you know, the first 
six months were hell. We did, you know, despite what we look like on television, we was laughing, joking. Uh, we had that brotherly camaraderie in the ring. They couldn't stand me, and I didn't feel too much warm uh, uh, about them. Because at that time, we came from two different cultures. See, when I got into the WWF, and I come from humble beginnings. I mean, I, I want to say that. I grew up in the projects in Brooklyn, New York. You know, we was like, we, 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 were, we were dirt poor. I mean, my parents did what they could, and we wasn't homeless or nothing. We had a, well, we lived in the projects, you know, and, and you know, we had that story going on. But when I moved out to California, and if I told my whole story, we'd be here till next Thursday. But when I moved out to California, I was fortunate and blessed enough to get the Hollywood experience. I had started doing things with, uh, you know, with a whole plethora of Hollywood people. I was doing telethons with like the likes of Clint Eastwood and Michael Keaton wow. and Weird Al Yankovic and, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, big names and, you know, hanging out with the creme de la creme of Hollywood. And I was making pretty good money. I was riding limousines and staying in five-star hotels and eating the best of food and, and, and the best of environments. And, and that kind of like, you know, was the life that I was living. So when I got on the road with, with, with uh, Mo and Mabel and they wanted to stay at Motel 6 and eat at a truck stop, oh, yeah, I had a problem with that. Because I mean, I had graduated from that. I'm like, I'm, I, I, I'm like, and it was, a, it was, a, it was a fight. They were like, "Man, we trying to save money. We ain't going to no Marriott." I was like, "Okay, well, you don't go to no damn Marriott. You go right to the Red Roof where you want to go. I'm going to the uh, Sheraton, or I'm going to the Hilton, and I will see y'all tomorrow." And I mean, it was we were. I, constant odds about where to stay where to eat <laughs> and all of the kind of stuff like that but we came to a happy medium once they started making money and saw that this was going to go on for a while and they started getting used to not the high life but a better life it evened out because I compromised all right all right, we won't go to the Marriott. But we'll go to the Holiday Inn. Can we go to the Holiday Inn? All right, I'm happy. <laughs> it's just funny, man. It's just funny hearing that. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Now, I've got to ask you, you know, the crowds got behind you when you were coming out, you know, as, as a free, you know, amazing, amazing. How, how was that coming out when you were performing? For the crowds before the matches, because you were you were over you were over so much with the crowd, didn't you? It was incredible you know, looking looking back to that time, Oscar. I gave them all the energy I could muster up, and they gave the energy back to us, and that was for me. That that I I, I can't you can't buy that with money, you know the only regret that I have was that I mean, and, and just to say Wrestlemania 10 was um, Wrestlemania 10 in the Boston Gardens with the four doinks gimmick those are my two favorite matches that really really stand out um, Madison Square Garden really 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 gave it to me that day had we won the titles that day they would have probably rushed the ring I believe. I'm, and one of my regrets is that didn't happen and I didn't get to see that. But my biggest regret is I never got to test my chops at a, at a stadium. A stadium show. I would have loved to have seen if I could really, really pull that off. And I didn't. And I, I wish I could have. Also, just to correlate it with WrestleMania 10. We had the WrestleMania 10 rap as well that you did. I was I was watching that earlier, just jogging my memory. So yeah, how was that mm -hmm. doing a rap how was that doing a rap for WrestleMania 10? 
No, oh, man. I mean, it was it, it was great because that was um, most of the uh, raps that we did. We shot the videos um, at the office, um, um, at, at, at the office, and but WrestleMania that rap was different because I suggested that we do it on location, and we did it at Madison Square Garden, you know, with all the New Yorkers crowding around, giving us support, and then you know, with the uh, with the kids behind us, you know, it just turned out to be. You know, a it just felt like a real music video by real musicians, and I mean, there were just things that I wanted to do in this business. Wrestling fell into my lap. That was nothing but God. I say it was an accident because that's not, you know, where my focus was. I mean, I started rapping, and I wanted to be like rap recording artists. I wanted to be on tour. I wanted to have the girls, which is why I started rapping in the first place. You know, I never <laughs> thought it would amount to nothing. I started rapping because I wanted to meet girls. But I wanted to make the videos and make the records and have the same fame and adulation. I wanted to be like the Run DMCs and the Curtis Blows and the Grandmaster Flashes and the Houdinis and all. Yeah, I wanted to, that. That was my that, that was my goal. It happened in a way, but it happened different because I got the WWF where you want to go on tour? <laughs> you rarely go on tour. <laughs> you want to rap in different cities? You going to rap... <coughs> Excuse me. You want to rap in different cities? You going to rap in all of them. Matter of fact, let's throw in a few countries and a couple of continents along the way. You want it? Be careful what you wish for. Because we going to tie your ass out. And that's what happened. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. You're saying about other countries. So I'm assuming you did get to the UK for the tours over here. Yeah. At the, time. Um, the UK. Yeah. Um, Prince Royal Albert Hall in London is where All we won you. the titles for the weekend. So, yeah, I got to the UK a few times. How, how was that? How was the uh, UK culture for you and stuff? Like, if you can remember... Some it, of the stuff. it was different. It was it, it was different. I ran into I don't know all the girls that I ran into didn't shave their underarm for some reason. I, I, <laughs> found, I found that to be different. Um, but to, no, more to the point, things were different. The texture of the food was different. Um, the uh, they had McDonald's, but even the mayonnaise had a different texture to it. The burgers tasted funny. The chicken tasted funny. But, I mean, I got to see things that you only see. You know, you, you got to understand something. Coming from where I came from and then being where I was was just an amazing paradox in my life. I, I grew up in a project in Brooklyn where I hardly went anywhere. I came down here to the South every year. Because this is where my mother's people were from. Mm -hmm. But I would see, like, the changing of the guard and Trafalgar Square and the Piccadilly. That's stuff that I would see on television. But then I wake up one day and I'm actually seeing mm. Trafalgar Square. And I'm seeing the changing of the guard up close and personal. I got to see the window in Rome where the Pope comes out. I didn't see the Pope that day. But I got to be at the Vatican and saw where the Pope came out and made his speech. But, you know, it was, like, it was like this black door. And my favorite, Owen Hart and I went to the Coliseum in Rome to the exact spot where Bruce Lee shot Chuck Norris, uh, uh, fought Chuck Norris. We took a picture there. I mean, so those are the kinds of experiences that, you know, I could die a happy man because, you know, people don't get to 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 to, to do that, you know. I mean that that's and oh go oh my oh when I'm leaving one out going to Israel, my hotel was on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is mentioned in the Bible. You someplace where the where the beginning of man where they hung out. This is where you at right now. 
So yeah, I mean, I can go on for days, but Absolutely. those are some of my those, those are some of my uh, my my paramount experiences being there. And again, who I gotta thank. Vince McMahon. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can't put a price on those experiences, Oscar, either. Priceless. No, no, no. You, you can't put a price on it. Now, you've spoken about Owen. I'd like to ask a bit more about Owen. Now, we know he was into ribs and practical jokes and stuff like that. And we know all the guys loved Owen, uh, you know, passing away in 99. So sad. So sad. But yeah, some, some stories of Owen off the top of your head. Yeah, I got one good one. I was on a bus uh, somewhere overseas. And when you get on the bus, and this is most people, except the likes of Owen, because he was busy. I fall asleep on the bus in a deep sleep. And when I wake up, I am slathered from head to toe and looking like Frosty the Snowman. <laughs> Because this food and uh, just draped me with shaving cream. And I know it was him. I know it was you, Owen, and I know you can hear me. Yeah, it, 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 was, it was Owen. So, yeah, but, but that's, you know, one of the things I can remember. But what I would say is Owen and Brett were two of the biggest mentors that I had. Owen would take me to work out. Owen would take me and show me some wrestling moves. I mean, he was a real mentor and an even better friend. And, uh, and and Brett, you know, everybody wasn't nice to me. They wasn't because no, no. you had a lot of people that were really resentful that a guy came who wasn't grandfathered into the business that didn't come from a school or, you know, get, got into wrestling the, the traditional way. And it rubbed some people the wrong way, but not Owen and Brett. Owen and Brett really helped me along. Owen and Brett really looked out for me. And I'll never forget that. That's nice, man. That's nice to hear. Because I've read, obviously, and in interviews you've done, I've heard there was issues with the click. You know, you're saying about people who weren't very, very helpful and that. So it's nice. It's nice to hear, you know, some positive stories. And uh, Brett, Brett's still my favorite of all time. You know, thirty. Yeah, but, uh, Brett. Brett and and Brett has this in his book. Uh, I'm so honored by that. Brett and I were in Germany, and Brett and I went to this bar, and the bar turned out to be a skinhead bar. Now here I am, a black guy in a skinhead bar. Brett disappeared, and I was really nervous. But Brett, I tell you, by the time I came out and saw Oscar. Oscar was at the bar with the guys drinking coke like he was like like, like he was one of the boys. And these wasn't just these wasn't skinheads you see on TV here. These were real skin. These were the real original skin Hitler skinheads. It was and Brett found that to be so funny. I didn't find it funny. He left my ass. <laughs> Any uh, any other guests you want to who you you know help hold in high esteem, should I say, to this day, who, who were helpful? You know? um, guys that I hold. Yeah, there, there's a quite a few. Um, Kevin Nash was really, really, really nice. I sat down and had many talks with him. Crush was really, really nice. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we traveled together and we talked and swapped stories. Macho Man was the reason I got into the business, and he was a really good mentor. Undertaker was really, really, really nice. We didn't spend too much time together, but when we did speak, it was really, really cordial, and he made me feel at home. Um, IRS was the first person to actually welcome us into the WWF. It was at a bar. Nobody else said, Welcome to the WWF. But, you know, one night at the bar, he did. And that, that really touched me. Ted DiBiase. To this day, and he's a preacher now. Um, just to show you that relationship. I ran into him two years ago. And while we were in New Jersey, and while I was there, my wife and mother-in-law 
got into a car accident and they were okay, but it really shook me. And Ted DiBiase is an ordained minister now. So I asked him to come into the bathroom and pray for my me and my family, and he did. And it just brought me to tears. But that's who he was. That's who he is now. And that really touched me. And, you know, yeah, there's just um, a, a, a myriad of people that... Um, there's there are people that wasn't there when I was there. Um, you know, I didn't work with them, but when I see them, they show me such love and respect, you know, that I, I just, it just, it just brings me to tears. Um, I, I know that, um, one of the Hardy boys, uh, Jeff Hardy, I ran into him at the party and he smiled and, and yelled and hugged me so tight. Like, 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 like we were boys and I never met Jeff Hardy, but that's the respect that people have. Yeah, mom. And it goes both ways, vice versa. Love his body of work. Love what he does. Love who he is. Praise for him and, and, and throughout his working through his issues or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I could say good things about a lot of good people. Oh, it's nice, man. It's nice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I was reading some background on yourself. You watched pro wrestling as a youngster, as a kid. So who were some of your favorites? Because, you know, this is before the business. You went full circle. You ended up in the business. But, yeah, some of the guys that you love watching when you, when you were a kid, because I know you followed wrestling from a young age. Yeah, when I was nine years old, you know, my, my brother, I have a brother named Michael. And when something good was on TV and my stepfather was watching it, he would call us in and make us sit down and then and have us watch TV with him. And one night, midnight, I lived from, from New York. Wrestling came on one hour a week, midnight. And he called us in and he's like, I know these my boys going to like this. And yeah, uh, Bruno San Martino, Ivan Koloff, Ivan Putski, Andre the Giant, Haystacks Calhoun, Vince McMahon, and Anthony Rocco on commentary. And then in the South, you had <clears throat> uh, Argentino Apollo and oh, Mil Mascaris. Oh, that's got to be my favorite. Bob Backlund and Bob Backlund fact. Watch Bob Backlund when I was young, watching it on TV when I was a boy. Then got to work with Bob Backlund when Bob Backlund made his comeback during the New Generation era. That was another paradox in my life. And there's one more great story that's a paradox. Here it is. When my father took us to Madison Square Garden to see it live, we had nosebleed seats. But those are some of the best nights of my life. I'm seeing it live. The guys are seeing it on TV. And you see it. The only thing that was missing was the commentary. But Howard Finkel was the announcer back then at Madison Square Garden. Ladies and gentlemen, Bruno San Martino. I'm at WrestleMania 10, getting ready to go out. And Howard Finkel is still the announcer. And after all those years, he still looked the same. The guy that brought out Bruno San Martino when I was a kid looking at it from the nosebleed seats was the same guy calling the name of Oscar at WrestleMania 10 and every other time I was at Madison Square Garden. Now, could I mean, could you just imagine that? I can only I can only imagine being a fan, being a fan of it, of, of for us, and then to be immersed in it, just just amazing, amazing. I actually I was at Madison Square Garden for Bruno's induction into the Hall of Fame, so that's the one that that's the one and only time I've been to Madison Square Garden, the Mecca. But yeah, it was uh, the incredible night seeing him go into the Hall of Fame. So yeah, just that's one of my experiences of Bruno. <laughs> Now, are you coming to uh, are you coming to Dallas this year? I 
I am not, unfortunately, but I was there in 2016 for 32. Yeah, I've been to Dallas in 2016 for WrestleMania 32, but not going this oh, okay. year, unfortunately. All right. Are you at you at the conventions? Pardon me. Are you you at the conventions in Dallas? Are you at WrestleCon? Yeah, I am going to be at WrestleCon, courtesy of Millennium Wrestling Federation, and I'm hosting uh, I'm hosting a party, uh, which is uh, sponsored by Wrestle Travel. Um, the guys that you were talking yeah. about earlier, yeah, just yeah, in they're just hosting, in at Wrestle they, Travel, yeah, yeah, they host they're having a party, and I am the host. Brilliant! No, fantastic. Great news, great news. But you're looking forward to seeing the fans as well in Dallas for that from all over the world. Yeah, I, I, I'm especially looking forward to seeing my UK fans. I have not been to the UK since um, my tenure in WWE back in the 90s. So I'm looking forward to fellowshipping with them. And I'm looking forward to getting over there. I'm going to get over there one way or the other before the year is out. That's cool, man. That's cool. There's promoters over here. There's conventions going on. So, yeah, I will be speaking to them as well about you getting over here, getting back to the UK for the first time in, like, oh, well, well over 20 years. So, yeah, that's that's cool. That's cool, man. What about modern wrestling? Before we get to the rap and your rap career and projects going on in that aspect, do you see much modern wrestling? What are your opinions on the modern product of wrestling? You know... I uh, um I think these kids today are very talented. Um I don't see the storylines um matured as I hope they would from back in the nineties in the Ruthless Aggression era and the Rock era and the Stone Cold era. Um I don't know. I I just think it's um I just think I think it needs to just get back to a place where it's just not right now. But the kids they have a lot of talent and they look very, very good and 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 and, 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 and all that. I watch and keep up with it because I do another podcast where I discuss it. You know, I think they're great. Um, I'm not. I don't. I don't watch NXT at all. I just don't because there's just no characters that I can associate with. Um, I watch AEW to discuss it, and then plus I indirectly work with AEW now. So, um, so yeah, I I keep up. Who, in terms of the AEW crop of talent who are there now, who are some of the guys that you, you do like within within uh, AEW? I'm glad, glad, more than glad that they acquired CM Punk. I'm glad they got Danny Bryan over there. I'm glad, um, I'm glad that uh, 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 Cody Rhodes is over here and he's spearheading the whole thing with the Jacksons. Um, Matt and his brother. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, I just think that they um, they have a very good crop of talent. I think they have very good wrestling. I think that the fact that they acquire people who are released from WWE and they come over there and they rebrand them and give them a whole new a whole new start and a whole new outlook on their career. Not just get them, just to be getting them, but they get them and do something with them. And, and I, I think that that's fantastic. I think the fact that they've got the, you know, last amount of pay-per-views in a year, it harkens back to the old WWE where you can build stuff like, you know, MJF and Punk now, they've been going at it since November verbally, but haven't struck one another, have they? And stuff like that, there's a good build to that. That, that takes me back to the old school um, storylines and build to a big match. And I think, you know, when they do come against each other next month on the pay-per-view, it's going to be amazing. 
that that's very old school to me, the way they've done that build. Because they've not laid hands on one another, have they? Yeah, I mean, um, they, <laughs> whenever uh, WWE has like a contract signing or anything else, it always ends up with a violent calamity. I mean, you know, just save it, you know, build something, have the fans wait. And then it'll mean more, but that's just me. That's just one man's opinion. Hey, it's got we've all got our opinions. With it. That's that's great. That's great. But it's good to hear you talking in a positive light about the modern modern product. Absolutely, absolutely. Oscar, we'd be remiss. We're here to talk about your rap projects that are going on. So I'd love to hear what's going on with the rap music and what what you got you know, coming I, up. I, I I would be almost embarrassed. Years ago, and this uh, this a- a- answers the question: like, where are they now? And where are they now? Me, I was nowhere. I was just nothing, just sitting, just like you see me sitting now. This is my career. Where are they now? I- Oscar's on his lazy boy at home, you know, just eating, getting fatter, and everything else. But no, now I'm deeply involved with a music project. I- made an album that dropped September 12th. It is doing very well on SoundCloud and Spotify, iHeartRadio. I've got a a video uh, called Socrates Cafe that got over 1 million views. Amazing. Um, And um, it's, uh, you know, great. The album is called The First Round. It's produced by a man named Gregory T. Simmons. For a company, for a movement called, um, um, sorry, Starch Moderates, and they produced the album. I p- recorded it at the Chicago Recording Company, where Michael Jackson did some of Thriller, and Madonna records there, and Molly Cyrus, uh, and it's just the state of the art, the best studio in the country. You really can uh, perform, uh, you know, record at. And uh, it's just been a dynamic experience. The music is getting great numbers. Oh, uh, the Grammy board actually nominated it to get a nomination for a Grammy. Now, I didn't get the nomination, but I was one step to getting it for Socrates Cafe. And that speaks volumes of the project. Now, as a rapper, you know, whatever little bit of rap talent that I have, and I, I say this with all modesty and humbleness, I made this rap. See, I did not know that they were going to put this kind of energy behind this record when it came out. I thought they were just going to get me to make a record, put it on his website. But no, they are doing all the steps and then some that a record company does. They just got finished on... um doing a big uh, uh, production to make a video for one of the songs called The Bigfoots Are Coming, which is about an NFL expansion team that they're proposing, and I made a rap about it, and they just finished the video yesterday. Um, It's just amazing, the work that's being put into it. I have a team of about 30 people who are just constantly working on everything to do with this record. So, yeah, it is different from wrestling, but it's another part of the dream I had when I went into my whole rap career. That's cool, man. No, it's good to see that you're busy with the rap. Absolutely. No, that's good. That's good. Good to hear, man. Absolutely. So, yeah, uh, just uh, before we go, where can mm-hmm. the viewers, where can the viewers and listeners find you? Because my show is on all the podcast apps, Spotify, Apple, everywhere. And obviously we're on YouTube. So, yeah, where can they find you? And uh, yeah, where can they find the record records and stuff like that? That'd be great before we before we go. Um, you can find me on um... I'm not a big so I don't have a big social media presence. Uh, Greg Gerard, G A R A R D, and Men on a Mission, The Legacy. Those are the two places on Facebook where you can find me. You know, let's be friends on Facebook. I don't care. Uh, we'll, we'll keep up. 
Men on a Mission, the legacy is where you find all things. Men on a Mission, uh, you can go and, you know, we check that. And uh, the music is on every platform that there is. Uh, SoundCloud, Spotify, iHeart, Pandora, everywhere. Just put in DJ Staunch and Casanova Ace. That's my rap name, Casanova Ace. And you can find the music, all the music from the first round, which is the name of the record, and see which how you think about it. Perfect. So that is where you can find all Oscar's stuff. And thank you very much all the way from Atlanta, Georgia, by way of Brooklyn, New York. It's full yeah, by way of Brooklyn. Absolutely. I had to get that in there. Absolutely. Yeah. Oscar, former WWF, WWE talent with Men on a Mission with Mo and Mabel. I had great memories, man, when you guys came out, honestly, because I, I was I was quite young when you guys came in to WWE. But great, fond memories, man. Just an absolute honour and a privilege having you on today, sparing the time for coming on. I appreciate that. Speaking of young, one more quick story. Yeah, this absolutely. May be, this, may, this may be tear up. There was a guy I spoke to it was about a couple of years back at a WrestleMania, and this is the one in New Orleans. And he told me, he said, I got to tell you this story. He said, I tell it on shows all the time. When I was an eight-year-old kid, you were on a payphone, and I came up to you, and you stopped your conversation. You talked to me, and you gave me an autograph. And that touched me, and that just sent me on my path to becoming a professional wrestler. It was one of the things that sent me on my path. And that guy was Luke Gallows. No and way. He, yeah, Amazing. he told me that. And oh my God, you never know. But the, the moral of the story is that we're going to go. The moral of the story is be nice to people no matter mm -hmm. what. You never know who you're talking to and you never know what lives that you affect in your life when you treat people right or wrong. So it's best to treat them right. And with the kids today, and this, this is a, the toughest time for children that I could ever remember in the history of my life, and I'm 58 years old. So we have to do everything we can do, whether you interact with them for five minutes or you're a teacher or whatever it is, set the kids on the right path because you never know where they can go. And look where Luke Gallows went. See, you inspired somebody. That, that's just that's amazing. And you know, look, look yeah, how well, no, look how well, look how is. well he's done I'm in the proud business. Of that. That's amazing. Exactly. Amazing story. I'm so proud. I'm, I'm so proud that he told me to share that story with me and that I was instrumental in that moment in his life. That's great. Oscar. Thank you so much for coming on Stu's Wrestling Podcast today. And I will be in contact with some of the convention people over here in the UK because there's plenty there's plenty of comic cons as well across across the UK. And also I will be in touch with the promoters for you. All right, I, I appreciate that. You know how to get a hold of me. Let me know what's happening. Thank you oh. very much. Big, big thank you to Chris Dutton for editing. As always, we are back. It's 2022. After a little break, nearly two months off. It's nice to be back. Thank you, Chris, for everything, as always. And for the introduction, Mike, Mad Dog Angus, as always. Again, thank you very much, sir. And to Evade Escape, as you can hear in the background there. And from the intro, for Get Up and Move, their latest single. Thanks, guys, for allowing us to use the music. And we will see you later in the month. The Stews Wrestling Podcast.